again. Monica Schmidt's interest in Sherlock Holmes began when she received a children's edition of the Mysteries of Sherlock Holmes. Which is, I'm working my way up to that. <laughs> uh, when she was five, and she has, has worked her way up to the Devil Day edition by the time she was 11. Her interest in Holmes has never waned. After receiving her master's degree in counseling psychology, she began her career counseling sexual offenders. I don't know if you know anyone professionally in the audience. I, I know. <laughs> Some of whom um, have intellectual disabilities. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she has worked as the lead substance abuse assessment counselor at the Iowa Prison Systems Intake Correctional Facility and is a certified alcohol and drug counselor. She is currently the outpatient clinical supervisor for Prelude Behavioral Services in Iowa City. Monica has devoted a significant amount of her time traveling throughout the Midwest and beyond to Sherlock and Beth and is a member of the Hounds of the Baskerville. The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, the John H. Watson Society, the Younger Stanfords of Iowa City, which she runs, and of course, the Norwegian Explorers. <laughs> she has recently been certified as a licensed mental health counselor, and perhaps can run a few sessions. <laughs> Today, Monica is combining her interest in Holmes with her professional interests, and will be talking to us about Holmes substance abuse. Ladies and gentlemen, Monica Schmidt. Okay, talk about a misadventure. Um, apparently, my tech foo is poor. Uh, but uh, thanks to the Commons Hotel and their amazing staff for getting me up and running, as well as the patience of Tim Johnson. Yes! So, um, as Julie said, I'm a substance abuse counselor and a, and a licensed mental health counselor. Um, usually when I tell people this, um, especially at Sherlockian events, they scatter like cockroaches when you turn the light on, considering um, the role of Shaw. But uh, today, what I want to do is I want to take a look um, at uh, my profession and how it applies to Sherlock Holmes. What is it tonight? Morphine? Or cocaine? Well, I can strongly recommend a 7% solution of cocaine. Would you care to try it? Oh, what's in the needle, says Basil Rathbone in the closing scene of The Hound of the Baskervilles in 1939, solidifying the popular impression of Sherlock Holmes as a drug addict. Over the decades, the image has been perpetuated and reinforced. Nicholas Meyer's novel, The 7% Solution in 1974, and the 1976 film based upon the, uh, you know, or based upon the book, focus on or Holmes' battle to, um, to break from addiction. A hypodermic syringe is the first, among the first things um, to which the camera pans in the Granada television adaptation of The Scandal in Bohemia. The BBC series alludes to Holmes' habit uh, by way of a drugs bust and a very telling exchange between Holmes and Watson. While most television shows and films make, merely make reference to the drug use, CBS's Elementary does away with it, uh, the subtlety entirely in which, is, um, in which their Holmes, Johnny Lee Miller, is an addict in recovery who regularly attends Narcotics Anonymous meetings. Similarly, over the years, um, Sherlockian scholars have sometimes joked about Holmes in his cocaine or morphine use. And occasionally, some people have tried to take the matter a little more seriously. In 1978, Jack Tracy and Jim Berkeley wrote the uh, quintessential tome, Subcutaneously, My Dear Watson, in which might be considered to be the definitive analysis of Sherlock Holmes's cocaine use. The, the little volume analyzes the canonical evidence and provides insights into Victorian attitudes towards substance use and abuse. In addition, there have been dozens and dozens of articles published in Sherlockian journals and anthologies to discuss the effects of cocaine <coughs> and other drugs, whether, and whether Holmes's use was enough to constitute addiction. But there's still room to ask whether Holmes, um, the Holmes of the canon, not the Holmes of screenwriters' imaginations, was truly an addict by modern diagnostic standards. 
Is it possible that years of interpretation and reinterpretation have magnified a minor behavioral quirk well beyond its original scope? Where does the fact leave off and the myth begin? Surprisingly, there is very little attention in this regard to the most important tool that professionals, at least in America, um, use when confronted by a patient or a client um, that has been using drugs. And whether or not he or she admits it might be a victim of an addiction. That tool is the Diagnostic and Statistics Manual of Mental Disorders, universally known to practitioners as the DSM. In the United States, the DSM is the primary clinical tool to diagnose mental health disorders, which um, by definition includes substance use disorders. In 1952, the American Psychiatric Association developed the first DSM. And um, over the last 63 years, um, it's gone through a great number of changes to stay current with societies and medicine's constantly evolving understanding of psychopathology. The tome was developed in order to standardize the diagnosis of such disorders, just because if you get 10 psychologists in a room, and I think Bob Steck can attest to this, you, know, you might get 10 different diagnoses um, if they're just going by the fly. So the current one is the fifth edition, um, known universally as the DSM-5. For each mental health disorder, the DSM-5 provides a spe very specific listing of criteria to support or rule out a diagnosis, or to differentiate one diagnosis from another. For example, uh, the inclusion or exclusion of hypomanic or manic episodes, which in turn are defined within the uh, DSM, is how clinicians are able to distinguish between someone who is experiencing a mild depression and another one who suffers from bipolar disorder. of Sherlock Holmes from 1939, just as an aside. So, uh, as I say, this is the most accurate, as I say, the DSM-5 is the most accurate and professional measure by which one can determine Holmes's cocaine um, use and whether it rises to the level of addiction, which is, as I say, used in this context as a technical term, um, not necessarily a mere slur. Um, what we want to do is basically a simple examination of the evidence um, and look in the DSM-5. Um, and figure out um, basically whether um, what is written in the canon rises to society's understanding of addiction and whether the canonical passages actually fit the, di the specific diagnostic criteria. So drawing upon my own experience in assessing clients, um, as, as, I say, as Julie mentioned, I was the uh, lead assessor for the Iowa prison system. So in a space of two years, I did over 2,000 substance abuse evaluations. Um, you know, on people ranging from, um, you know, people who are in for the simple possession of marijuana to, um, um, you know, as I say, homicide. Um, but drawing on my own clinical experience, um, I will present a specialist analysis and definitively answer the question of whether or not Mr. Sherlock Holmes was, uh, from a clinical perspective, an addict. So, the term addict and addiction appears absolutely nowhere within the DSM-5. Um, addict or addiction is a word that's thrown around, but it's not a clinical term, but a colloquial one. In other words, clinicians do not diagnose in terms of whether a person is addicted, but in terms of the severity of a problem, uh, the problems in a person's life that are caused by the substance use. Continued use, despite a growing number of increasing negative or increasingly negative consequences, is the hallmark that society has accepted as the behavior of an addict. So um, in um, the previous edition of the DSM, the DSM-4 TR, or for text revision, uh, that was released in 1994, uh, there used to be two categories for diagno diagnoses for substance use. Abuse, which is kind of your low level, um, you know, uh, your college kid drinking a little too much and getting an OWI. And then dependence, where um, it's basically a lot more of a pervasive, um, you know, a pervasive issue. 
Um, in, or historically speaking, um, once a person was diagnosed with, with um, substance dependence, or let's say alcohol dependence, a person was an addict for life, or basically um, in the era of pre-existing conditions, this is a diagnosis that would follow you for the rest of your life. If you're diagnosed with alcohol use dependence, or sorry, if you're diagnosed with alcohol dependence at age 25, until you die, you had alcohol dependence, even if it was in remission. So in the DSM-4-TR, dependence was more or less the equivalent of what would be, um, would be considered an addiction. <coughs> so in the DSM-5, things changed a lot. Um, the, uh, as I say, which was released in 2013. The DSM-5, um, the American Psychiatric Association recognized that it, uh, it's a little bit more of a gradient, that people over the course of their life slide up and down or fall off the scale. So what they decided to do is that they brought in 11 diagnostic criteria. They combined the diagnostic criteria from the DSM for abuse, four, and dependence, seven, and created 11 and raised the gradient. So two to three of the diagnostic criteria meant a person has alcohol use disorder, mild, or four to five, moderate, or six or and above, severe. Now, uh, to meet the minimum threshold, uh, basically, a person, if a person's criteria, or meets six or more criteria, then, give or take, that's about, um, that's more or less equivalent of addiction. Again, as a clinician, addiction is not a term that I use, it's a term that my clients use, um, but you know, um, if we're gonna be translating from layman to clinical terms, this is an approximation. So um, for our international crowd, um, I included also a little bit on the ICD-10, uh, which would be the Inter International Statistical Classification of Diseases and Health Related, or, or Related Health Problems. They have six diagnostic criteria, and a person needs to meet at least three of those. Fortunately, there's a pretty significant overlap between the ICD-10 criteria and the DSM-5 criteria that we'll be exploring momentarily. I am a drug addict, Marcus. Two years ago, I was as pitiable soul as you could ever meet. So the question is, how many criteria does Holmes meet? So what I'm going to be doing is looking at the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria and doing a layman's explanation, just because I want to make sure all of you guys understand what the heck I'm talking about, because the psychobabble does get a little on the technical side. So. Um, in order to have a substance use or diagnosis, a person needs to have a problematic pattern of substance use leading to a clinically significant um, pattern of impairment or distress is magnified by at least two, which would be mild, of the following within a 12-month period. So everything is limited to a 12-month span. Since I'm a clinician, if I'm doing an evaluation on a person who's sitting in front of me, I'm going to be looking at that 12 months. Um, because I'm doing kind of a cold case analysis, I can't interview Holmes and Watson, um, you know, bless them, but uh, they're not around. All I have is Watson's writings, uh, or Watson's and Holmes's writings um, to choose from. So, um, you know, a clinician gets to, to play a little in the gray, nebulous gray area. So the first, di uh, the first criterion is substance is taken in larger amounts over a longer period of time than was intended. So I'm gonna use alcohol as my example just because that's the thing that is uh, most universally um, accessible, especially to us Sherlockians. Um, so imagine going in and going out for a beer and then um, you know, without much forethought, you know, 10 beers later, you know, you're thinking you're gonna stop after two, 10 beers later, you're still going. It's kind of a non-conscious decision to keep on going. So that's what criteria one is referencing there. So criteria two, which also incidentally overlaps with the ICD-10 criterion B, would be a persistent desire or unsuccessful efforts to cut down or control a person's use. So if a person says, I need to cut down, and then they, really, they, they try and they can't, or they just keep on saying, I need to cut down, but don't, 
that would qualify for criteria number two. Criteria number three is a great deal of time is spent in activities necessary to obtain, use, or recover from the substance. In this one, I'm going to refer to um, my clients who are um, addicted to methamphetamine or connected with methamphetamine. I've had clients that need their fix um, every single day. I've had clients go 60, 80, 100 miles in order to find them because their normal dealer or the local dealer is out. So it's about um, spending time obtaining, using, and recovering where basically the life is revolving around a person's substance use. You get that a lot with alcohol, you get that a lot with methamphetamine, you get that a lot with heroin and other opiates as well. Um, number four, craving or a strong desire or urge to use. So as my clients would say, Jones and Ford or Fiend and Ford, you know, where you kind of have that taste, that drive, I need it. Uh, criterion five would be recurrent um, use resulting in failure to fulfill major role obligations um, at work, school, or home. So if it's interfering with um, work, if it's interfering with your parenting, if you're a parent, if it's interfering with your ability to uh, engage with other people, or if it's um, against the rules and you're doing it anyway, this all qualifies. Um, I have a lot of clients that are on probation. Um, so conditions of, of legal probation usually prohibit the use of alcohol or marijuana use. So if a person is on probation and told that they're not supposed to, and they're doing it anyway, they qualify for number five. All right, diagnostic criteria number six, continued use despite having a persistent or recurrent social and interpersonal problems caused or exacerbated by the effects of the substance. Also known as we're having fights because or disagreements or arguments because of the substance use. So somebody's expressing concern. Has your mom ever said, hey, I'm worried about your drinking? Or I'm worried that you're smoking the ganj? No. Um, but um, in this case, uh, this is one that we're going to be seeing a lot of, so pay attention to that one. Number seven, important social, occupational, recreational activities are given up or reduced because of the substance use, which again overlaps with the ICD-10 criteria E. Um, in this case, it is all about um, basically there are the substance use interfering. You know, choosing to go out and uh, get high instead of going to family Christmas. Even though sometimes we know that we don't want to spend the time with the family. You know, smoking crack instead of going to Christmas. Bad idea. All right. Recurrent use in situations that are physically hazardous. So um, in the state of Iowa where I reside, um, um, it's operating while intoxicated. Um, so that doesn't necessarily mean, or it's not limited to um, just air cars. You can operate a boat while intoxicated. If you're doing that more than once, um, either a boat, a car, anything, a horse, you can get an OWI while drunkenly riding your horse. Um, it qualifies, um, you know, um, your forklift. Um, but yeah, situations that are physically hazardous. So if, if you're over the legal limit and you're driving more than once, or you know, within a 12-month tw um, calendar year, you can qualify for criterion eight. Criterion nine is use despite knowledge of having a persistent or recurrent physical or psychological problem that is likely to have been caused or exacerbated by the use. Uh, ICD criterion F. Um, it's basically continued use despite having a mental health um, or physical health issue. So if you have depression, and you continue drinking alcohol, which is a depressant, it's exacerbating the effects of the depression. It's making it worse. Criterion nine. Criterion 10 is tolerance, um, which overlaps with the ICD-10, um, criterion D, uh, which would be a need for markedly increased amounts of the substance to achieve intoxication or desired effect, or a decreased amount uh, or diminished effect with the same amount of the substance. So think back to when y'all had your first alcoholic beverage. Some people have a natural tolerance, some people don't. Some people will have one drink and get a little tired. Some people fall asleep after two. Some people will have a six pack and say, hey, where's the party at? <laughs> um, now, if, as I was say, over the course of many years and continue drinking, um, a person's tolerance eventually slowly ratchets up. Imagine, as I was say, just for self-reflection, how much alcohol it takes now to get that same type of buzz that you first got when you first started drinking. Things to consider. And this is why people scatter like cockroaches when I talk about this. <laughs> All right, and then there's withdrawal, as manifested by the characteristic withdrawal syndrome from the substance, which is typically the opposite effect. So with alcohol, um, this is one of the reasons why people, if they've had a heavy night of binge drinking, the next morning are kind of irritable, agitated, a little shaky. 
basically it's the rebound effect. So your body is basically kind of trying to balance itself out since it's a depressant. It's, um, you know, it basically your body is like, hey, what the heck happened? And just kind of rebounds up. Or a substance or closely related substance is taken to relieve um, or avoid withdrawal symptoms. So hair of the dog that bitch ya. Arf. Um, so, or mimosa or Bloody Marys, things to consider. Did you make a list? <laughs> you put on weight. That waistcoat's clearly newer than the jacket. Stop it, just stop it. Did you make a list? Of what? Everything, Sherlock, everything you've taken. Nobody deceives like an addict. Not an addict, I'm a user. I deviate boredom and occasionally heighten my thought process. <laughs> justifications, justifications. Okay. Everything that I've explained sounds simple enough, but um, to a clinician um, who has an understanding with their, a clinician needs to have an understanding within the context that uh, whether a person meets the criteria um, in order to avoid properly um, applying a diagnosis. So for example, the eighth criterion, uh, operating a vehicle under the influence of alcohol. Now, the question that I as a clinician would ask is, is a person having four drinks within an hour, which um, you know, and then getting behind the wheel, which is enough to put um, anybody in this room over the legal limit? Or if it is a person having one drink in a one hour period and then getting behind the wheel? And the former, that would qualify for um, you know, a hazardous situation. For most people in this room, one drink isn't enough to create a, a degree of hazard. So as a clinician, I have to be able to tease out um, you know, life circumstances and be able to differentiate in order to not, um, you know, kind of over-diagnose my clientele. Um, so knowing the answer to the contextual questions is how a clinician um, avoids uh, misapplying the criteria and misdiagnosing um, clients. So there are 23 passages in the canon that refer to substance use. 13 of these mention cocaine, morphine, or both, and only five of those passages directly refer to Holmes's use. The passages are very descriptive of how Holmes and Watson have been both affected by his use of the 7% solution. And if one lays these passages side by side with the diagnostic criteria, it's fairly easy to see from a clinical perspective whether or not Holmes meets the diagnostic thresholds. So y'all can read that. <laughs> or I can do it too. Sherlock Holmes took the bottle from the corner of the mantelpiece and his hypodermic syringe from its neat Morocco case. With his long white nervous fingers, he adjusted the delicate needle and rolled back his left shirt cuff. For some time, his eyes rested upon his forearm and wrist, all dotted and scarred with innumerable puncture marks. Finally, he thrust a sharp point home, pressed down on the tiny piston, and sank back into the level line armchair with a long side of satisfaction. Yada yada. Okay. Um, so, I was going to say, it's, I've had that memorized since I was like 12. Um, the narrative of the sign of four, it's three of the diagnostic criteria. So, we're looking at three, six, and 11. Holmes uses three times a day for many months. This indicates a great deal of time was spent in um, using and recovering from the effects of the substance. That's criterion three. Watson's single vocal objection um, basically um, it, it points out that he's bothered by Holmes's use. So keep this one in mind kind of as a tick mark for criterion six because it needs to be recurrent. So we've got one for criterion six that uh, Watson is acknowledging that he's bothered by this use. Um, Watson speaks of a black reaction that Holmes uh, experiences following the drug use. And this would indicate depression, which is a mental state typical of cocaine withdrawal. That's criteria 11. Okay. So in Scandal and Bohemia, uh, this particular passage speaks of two of the diagnostic criteria, 7 and 11. Watson talks with, about Holmes being buried in his, among his books in the lodgings of Baker Street because of his cocaine use. While Holmes was never a particularly social butterfly, he did have a pretty active lifestyle of attending various events outside of his rooms, such as concerts. This passage indicates that he would withdraw from society for weeks at a time, which suggests an interruption in his normal activities in favor of drug use. That's criterion seven. Um, also, cocaine is a stimulant, but Watson, a doctor, um, very skilled doctor, I'm gonna go with that, very skilled doctor uh, refers to the drowsiness of the drug, implying that he is talking about withdrawal symptoms in this passage, Criterion 11. self poisoner huh? Okay, so this passage meets Criterion 9. Uh, continued use despite a psychological problem that is caused or exacerbated by the substance. 
In one short sentence, Holmes acknowledges that his cocaine use, and his tobacco use for that matter, is physically damaging. Despite this admission, he continues to use. Um, in essence, there is, this is the essence of the criterion, um, is continuing <coughs> to use um, despite knowledge that the use physically or psychologically affects the person. So that's criterion nine. In Man with a Twisted Lip, two of the diagnostic criteria are confirmed here. Again, six and nine. Once again, Holmes acknowledges Watson referring to his use as a weakness. So yet again, Watson uh, voicing his concern. So we've got at least two, so that's enough for criterion six. And it also indicates the negative level of judgment for the use. So again, Holmes is using the spite of the knowledge that is physically damaging and to counter the, advi or counter the advice of a medical professional, his friend, Dr. Watson. Now this is my absolute favorite. This passage is the most telling because it touches on three of the criterion, seven, four, and five. From the phrase drug mania, indicating an excited and elevated mood and motor action, one knows that Watson is specifically talking about cocaine, for morphine, which is an opiate, causes drowsiness. Um, so Watson speaks of how this has caused an interruption and reduction of, of his normal lifestyle activities, again, criterion seven. He also refers to Holmes craving the drug, craving, criterion four, um, and what is implied is that Holmes' use has progressed to the point that is keeping him from fulfilling his major role obligations and therefore by or threatening his illustrious career. Criterion five, failure to fulfill major role obligations. A clinician would make also a pretty feasible argument that Watson's phrase of long-term leaning indicates that there's a long-standing desire and possible unsuccessful efforts you know, for Holmes to quit, which is the hallmark of criterion number two. So a clinician, by inference, uh, um, from, the or from the following passages, could make an argument that for criterion nine, um, based upon Holmes' uh, continued use despite a mental health condition, depression. So in a study in Scarlet, uh, this short passage uh, indicates a mild depression aggravated by lack of activity. This is further aggravated by withdrawal from cocaine, a stimulant, and the use of morphine, a uh, narcotic. In the sign of four, this passage appears um, to present an argument for criterion four, craving. Contextually, it's a little more indicative, or indicative of a mild depression. Once Holmes is without a case to stimulate and excite his brain, he turns to artificial means to quell the boredom and low feelings that set in. I think Benedict just talked about that. And Watson's analysis in the yellow face furthers this argument, indicating that he used as a means of keeping the tedium at bay. After all, many people use stimulants like cocaine as a means of nullifying their boredom and weakness, which is directly from the DSM, uh, pages 563 and 564, by the way, for those who want to reference that. Um, Holmes's use is indicative of a man who is self-medicating a mild depression. He continues to use despite knowing that the withdrawal is affecting his mental health. All three of these passages look at Criterion 9 and support Criterion 9. That should be the raw sap that the green grand mystic spoke of. Mmm, this is rather delicious and of an excellent quality. My word, Holmes, their sap is like a form of cocaine. Mm. Video games are fun. <laughs> okay, so now it all comes right down to it. Does Holmes meet the DSM-5 diagnostic um, criteria for cocaine use disorder severe? So me, uh, Holmes meets at, at first glance, as we're kind of going through all this stuff, uh, six of the or sorry, eight of the diagnostic criteria at first glance. These passages are um, mostly take place over a two to three year period between 1887 and 1889, which as a clinician doing a cold case analysis gives me enough wiggle room to make a workable argument that the criteria fit within the 12 month period of the, diagno or the DSM diagnostic um, you know, time frame. But additional considerations, I have to uh, consider a few additional things in order to avoid improper um, diagnosis. So, as previously indicated, the Criterion 2, um, which is referenced in um, the uh, missing three-quarter passage, is kind of built on a weak foundation. 
We're not entirely sure whether Holmes actually did have um, like a long-term desire to quit, um, you know, or unsuccessful efforts to quit. We also know that criterion, is, or criterion 3 is potentially feeble, um, as the 7% solution is kind of a weak solution of cocaine, um, and therefore not likely to take up a large amount of time using and recovering from the drug's effects. And criterion 5, that failed to fulfill major role obligations that we talked about. So based on the evidence that we have from the other 59 stories, um, you know, despite the passage from the missing three-quarter, Holmes' use really never has appeared to interfere with the completion of the case. So the question is, is it moderate or severe? Does it um, rise to the level of addiction? That leaves us with five of the diagnostic criteria, four, six, seven, nine, and 11. Cocaine use disorder, moderate. But, 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 but. Potency or concentration does not negate the possibility of addiction. Raise your hand if you've had a cup of coffee this morning. All right, everybody, all right, cool. How many, as I say, raise your hand if you normally have two, actually no, we'll go with three or more cups of coffee in a single day. If you didn't have your cup of coffee, raise your hand if you get, uh, if you don't have your coffee in the morning, raise your hand if you get headaches. Okay, uh, keep your hand up, keep your hand up if you get headaches. Now, how many of you guys are one cup of coffee drinkers? Well, put your hand down. There's a few of you guys in there. So again, if you look around the room, there's a few people that had their hands raised. One cup of coffee or 10 cups of coffee, it doesn't matter, it's caffeine. And some people in this room have indicated that, yes, in fact, they still experience some degree of withdrawal symptoms, even if they don't have their one cup of coffee. So the degree of potency, the 7% solution, it doesn't matter. And when you think about it, Watson, who's referencing how Holmes's life was affected in the missing three quarter and how it's negatively affected his cases, Watson's only given us the 50 or 60 stories to choose from. Watson would be far more well aware than the reader um, of how it's affected his case or how it's affected his ability to uh, engage in his occupation. So it really ultimately depends on how much stock we put into Watson's analysis from the missing three quarter which is the only passage that makes the uh, case for two somewhat questionable criteria. So, is it addiction? If we, uh, if we consider the missing three quarter, he fits six of the diagnostic criteria for the DSM-5, which does put him in cocaine use disorder severe. Now, referencing the ICD-10, he fit four of those. He only needed three to hit um, you know, the cocaine use disorder severe. Holmes is an addict. Oh, Watson, the needle. <laughs> now, if you don't mind, I've had rather a strenuous day. Yes. So I just touch the button. <laughs> questions. Yay, questions. I was diligently taking notes because my former career, I understand exactly what Monica does. The first thing I had to ask, though, is how much of this is self report? When, when you have somebody doing their thing, how much of what you're hearing, what you're basing your analysis on, is on their self-report? Um, in my profession or in this? Either. Okay, in my profession, a lot of it is, and I'm getting a little reverb there, um, it, pretty much everything for me is self-report, but we do deal with uh, collaborative information. We do have a lot of clients, as I said, that are legally mandated, and as a result of that, um, we have them sign, or we try to have them sign releases of information to probation officers or doctors or whatever um, in order to get collaborative information and collaborative evidence. So as a clinician, um, you know, I go by client self-report, and I hate to say it, but clients are not always the, the uh, most accurate historians yeah, exactly. <laughs> of, um, you know, of their own behavior. And as a result, sometimes uh, I have a client that says, no, Monica, I haven't used uh, marijuana in five years. And, I get the urinalysis back and it's uh, blazing hot for weed. Yeah. Yeah. Off the charts blazing hot. Um, or I have a uh, probation officer that says, no, he dropped three dirty ways last month. Oh, okay. Uh, obviously my client is not being forthcoming. So in doing this analysis, obviously I had um, you know, only the words of Watson to go on um, in, within these, the passages that reference Holmes' cocaine usage. 
But um, in this case, that's, uh, that's all I really have to go on. And since professionally I do use collaborative information, I figured that uh, I can could, I could make it work for this too. Well, the other question I have too is, if looking through the you know the criteria, mm -hmm. he was did a lot of tobacco smoking. Oh yeah. So I mean, every he probably did every criteria on that for the tobacco more so probably than the cocaine. But the cocaine is so much more fun and scandalous. True. <laughs> True. Uh -huh. Next question. Next Great question. presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned Use yes. the microphone, please. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> um, you mentioned the fact that whether or not it affects his professional performance will inform whether it's a moderate or severe. Uh, but one of the things, didn't you also say that it's not just the professional performance, but whether or not it's, it's affecting your life? It's so it's, it's in though, multiple areas. Right. Yeah. So it, even though it might not be affecting Holmes's professional, like it, the way he handles mm -hmm. cases, wouldn't Watson's objection to what it's doing to his personal life? Exactly. Okay. That, no, that, that, is, that is a correct understanding. And uh, as an example of this, I always reference Roger Ebert, the film critic. Uh, Roger Ebert um, self-identified as an alcoholic. Um, it wasn't a, he wasn't Lindsay Lohan or Charlie Sheen making headlines um, and uh, you know creating uh, creating lots of havoc in Chicago. You know he had a very successful career. Nobody would have known that he was an alcoholic in recovery until he wrote his blog. My name is Roger, and I'm an alcoholic in 2009, uh, which later became um, an, an expanded form of one of the chapters in his memoir. Um, I mean, it, as I say, that's only one of the you know, 11 criterion, or criteria. So, um, you know, there are 10 others and you only need six in order to hit severe. Okay. One more question. Oh. Yeah. And we can always chat about this later. I, I love talking shop. It, yes. It's my understanding that during this period of time that cocaine use wasn't looked the same way, particularly in the medical was staff, was the society as a whole. Can you comment on, on, on that and, and oh. why? Watson would have had a different view than a lot of doctors in that age. Well, um, I, was, I was going to say, at this point in time, I can say that, um, you know, because somebody said it's legal, alcohol is legal, that doesn't mean it doesn't necessarily cause problems. We all know the difference. Um, as far as Watson having cocaine, you know, kind of a, a, shall we say, a more advanced view on the idea of cocaine being a negative substance or a substance that causes negative effects. Um, I attribute that to his literary agents, um, you know, and literary agents' understanding of um, of cocaine. Even though it was con just like heroin, cocaine, a lot of things were considered to be wonder drugs back in the Victorian era, and uh, had turned out to be uh, pretty awful and terrible things. Um, so I'm I'm thinking that um, through the knowledge of the literary agent, uh, Watson knew that. Um, you know, um, he would see the um, effects firsthand. And in all honesty, you know, it does make for a little bit more of an interesting story where, you know, Holmes actually does have some flaws. You know, you've got this brilliant guy who is amazing and our hero, and yet he does this substance, um, you know, to alleviate boredom, um, you know, and in order to find excitement when he can't find excitement on a case. Uh, I mean, that's, that makes a very sympathetic character, you know, that makes a very interesting character, and then also um, Watson uh, throwing in a jiver, um, you know, mentioning that he doesn't really approve, also I think makes for a little bit more of an interesting dynamic between the two of them. Great. Thank you. I will admit that halfway through her presentation, I stopped substituting uh, instead of substance abuse, of purchasing books. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back at the top of the hour. <laughs>